The scripture reading today is from Matthew 28, 16 through 20, from the New Living Translation Bible. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. I believe, I think I believe, I hope to believe. I believe. In many mainline churches, they say it like this. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day He rose again, and He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic and apostolic church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It all starts with two words, I believe. In most expressions of Christian worship, some component of the service has centered on confessing what we believe most typically in the Apostles' Creed, as I just recited it. Now, Baptists have tended to be a non-creedal people. We're not much on creeds. We tend to say that the Bible, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, is our one and only creed. We don't go around reciting creeds in Baptist churches. But let's not fool ourselves. Baptists have creeds. They're just more informal and most often unspoken. It's, it's from our beliefs about God that our worship of God springs. Of course, when you think about that creed long enough and the contents therein, our knees should probably knock a little and our voices quiver a bit every time we recite it. The creed says that we're believers in creation, that all things have a sacred source and origin. We don't just believe in nature, we believe in creation. And the creed says that God's creative potential was not exhausted in creation, but it continues. God continues to do impossible things like virgin births and raising the dead. Speaking of raising the dead, the creed says we're believers in resurrection. Not just the immortality of the soul, that's not it, but in the resurrection of the dead, a bodily resurrection that one day God will make all physical things new, even as God is making all things new. We confess in the creed that Jesus is the judge of the universe and that the Holy Spirit is joining God's people all the world over into one sacred communion. Does any of that prompt any pause in your confession? It doesn't have to be this creed, it could be any creed. If someone asked you to stand up and speak from the depths of who you are about your deepest convictions, 
If someone asked you to give voice to your creed, could you do it? What would you say? Would your knees knock at all? Would your voice quiver even a bit? Most of the time, I find it difficult to stand up and speak about much of anything I believe in. Political realities, the possibilities of life on other planets, the possibilities of life on this planet. But to stand up and say, here are the things in which I believe. Here are the things that make me who I am, my core convictions. That's not an easy thing to do. And yet every time the church gathers to worship, whether formally or informally, the church stands up and says, I believe. The disciples had gathered on a mountain. You've got to be careful when you climb mountains, you know. All too often in the Bible, the thin air of the high altitudes become what Celtic Christians called thin places. Places where heaven and earth sort of blend together and you can't tell the difference between the two. Mountains. Those large masses that stand suspended between heaven and earth blurs the line between the two were places where you met God. You might remember Moses climbed Mount Sinai. The text says he spoke with God face to face as friends. And when Moses came down from the mountain, his face shone with an incandescent glow. And Elijah, do you remember when Elijah went on top of the mountain with the prophets of Baal? You remember that story? You've got one Elijah and the hundreds of the prophets of Baal. Elijah puts them to the test. Make an altar and sacrifice an animal and call upon the name of your God. And so they do. Nothing happens. Elijah says, do it again. Maybe your God went on vacation or is on the phone or something. Do it again. Trash talking. There is no trash talking like prophetic trash talking. They did it again. Nothing happened. Elijah says, pour water on the sacrifice. Water drenched the altar, filled the ditch around the altar. Elijah called upon the name of Yahweh. Fire from heaven, consumed the sacrifice, lapped up the water. That happened on a mountain. Earlier in this gospel, Jesus climbed a mountain. And He said to the crowd, Blessed are, congratulations to the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are mourning. Blessed are the meek and the pure in heart. And then Jesus would quote part of the law and say, You have heard it said, but I say to you. And then in the same sermon, He said to them, to His people, Your righteousness must be greater than that of the Pharisees. Your righteousness must be greater than that of the Pharisees. It was on a mountain where Peter, James, and John saw Jesus transfigured before them. And a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. Listen to Him. You've got to be careful when you climb a mountain. Things like that happen on tops of mountains. And it's from the mountain that Jesus gave the great charge of the Gospel of Matthew, the marching orders which would orient the lives of the future of His people. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The Great Commission, what the church is to be doing. But might I point out to you this morning that the Great Commission grew out of an act of worship. The first thing Matthew says is, when they saw Him, they worshipped. The commission grew out of an act of worship. You know, I think there are a great many Christians today who see the need to be out in the streets living the Great Commission, and Lord knows we do. But these same Christians struggle to see the need for worship. I kind of understand what they're saying. 
We're going to walk out of this room today having sung a few songs and prayed a few prayers and you will have heard a sermon, but the nations won't have been reached. Nothing tangible will have been achieved, no tangible benefit. We have nothing to show for this hour. We have not fed the hungry or housed the homeless or preached good news to those in the streets. Sometimes worship seems like a royal waste of time when the real work is done out there in the streets. <coughs> Excuse me. A few years ago, when I was pastoring my former church, we went on a venture one Saturday morning to the regional food bank. A group from our church go to pack boxes which can then be sent to the hungry in central Oklahoma. We show up, we're packing boxes full of canned goods and dry food items. And there's several other groups there. I walked over to the registration table to see who all was there and I noticed that we were working next to another group, you'll never guess, the Central Oklahoma Atheist Society. That's not what I expected. And there they were, packing boxes right beside us, putting the same goods in their boxes, we're putting in our boxes. And it dawned on me, the hungry won't care. Their Chef Boy RD will taste just like our Chef Boy RD. There they are doing good in the world. We've all seen people who wouldn't know Jesus from Adam, who are good people, who contribute to the good of the world. If that's the case, then what good is worship? If that's all God cares about, is doing good in the world, then what in the world are we doing in this room today? It can feel like a royal waste of time. But for the church, for us, worship is precisely that which propels us out into the world. This room is where our mission begins. Ponder this. The moment you say, let's engage the struggle for justice, you're going to have to figure out justice for whom? Who's justice? One person's justice is another person's injustice. How do you go about figuring that out? The moment you say, we should all live by reason and do the reasonable thing, you're going to have to answer the question, who's reason? Reason grows from common assumptions and common traditions. There is no naked reason out in the world. Who's reason? It's why we so often have conflict over what the reasonable, rational thing to do is. The moment you engage in changing the world, you have to figure out where you're going to turn when things get tough. From what well will you draw when you bump into the reality that none of us can change much in this world? We are not God. We're not even messiahs. And how do you engage changing the world without risking being changed somewhere in the depths of your own soul. It's hard to leak if you're not full of something. And the only thing that can leak out is what lives within. And how do you oppose the evil in the world without waking up one day and realizing you're participating in it and becoming the very thing you hate and oppose in this world? Deep questions. But for Christians, worship is the answer. Worship is what clears our eyes and illumines our minds. Worship is what opens our hearts and deepens our souls. Worship is what challenges our attitudes, reforms our attitudes, causes us to repent and renews our energies out in the world. Worship is what reminds us of our history. It re reminds us who we are as people. And it causes us to dream about God's future and to some degree imagine it into being. This church's mission is simply when our doxology puts on work boots and work gloves out in the world. The Great Commission is simply our praise in action out in the world. They worshipped on the mountain that day because they simply opened their eyes and ears. And did you hear what Jesus said to them? The first words Jesus says in this text, All authority in heaven or upon the earth has been given to me. All authority. I don't know about you, 
But for, for me, someone who lives in a democratic society, when I start hearing the words, all authority has been given to me, it sort of sounds like fingernails on the chalkboard. In our culture, we mistrust power and authority, which is why we divide it up in a democracy. We don't like centralized authority. We like branches of power, which can check one another. We don't like for all authority and all power to be held in one place. And yet Jesus comes and stands in our midst and says, All authority in heaven and upon earth has been given to me. We worship because we believe all authority has been centered in Jesus Christ. Every power answers to His power. Every throne bows before His throne. And nothing happens in this world, not in some third world country, not in a dark alley, not even in the shadows of our own souls. Nothing happens in this world outside of His sovereignty. We worship Him because all life is His life. All gifts are His gifts. All love is His love. We worship because all authority and power is concentrated in Him and Him alone. And in our worship of Him, we begin to exercise our authority in the same way that He does. We, be we begin to become servants. We begin not to seek power, but to use it for the good of God and the good of the world. In the same way Jesus did. All authority has been given to me. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him. But some doubted. Did you hear that? I had to read that a second time. I'm not sure that I can believe that. Some doubted. Did you hear how Matthew said it? When they saw Him, some, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. I can see doubting in the middle of the story when you're in the throes of it all. In fact, the only other time this word doubt is used in the Gospel of Matthew is in chapter 14, when Jesus is walking on water and Peter begins to join Him, walking on the water, and Peter begins to sink because he took his eyes off of Jesus. And Jesus picks him up and He says, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I, I can sort of see doubt there when you're walking on water. Most of us in this room would doubt. But this isn't the middle of the story. We're at the end of the gospel on top of a mountain. Jesus has been raised from the dead and has appeared to His disciples. We are at the climax of the gospel, the Great Commission. And yet there it is, plain as day. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. You could read this as two distinct groups. You've got the worshipers over here and the doubters over there. You've got the worshipers inside the church and the doubters outside the church. But that's not how the text reads to me. It sounds like they're the same group. When they saw Him, they worshipped and some doubted. Doubt and worship alive in the same group. Sort of like the centurion in Mark chapter 9. You remember that? The centurion says to Jesus, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. <laughs> I, I could be wrong. But there are times in my life when I have seen faith and doubt alive in me at the same time. I believe I've seen them sitting together on the very same pew. And I must confess to you today, there was a time in my life when I saw doubt as the grand enemy of faith to rid from our hearts and banish from our church. No room for doubt. But one day I realized that to the extent that we banish doubt, I would be banishing me from the church. And then one day it hit me. Doubt is not the antithesis of faith. Doubt is precisely that which causes faith to expand, to grow, to mature. Frederick Beekner says, Doubt is the ants in the pants of faith. It keeps it moving. Karl Barth, one of the great theologians of the 20th century, said, I do not know whether I believe. <laughs> I do not know whether I believe. But I know the one in whom I believe. 
You see, faith and doubt grow together and they inform each other. They actually enrich each other. In this text, Jesus tells His followers, go into the world and make disciples, learners, apprentices, not converts, not just sign on the line, but learners, growers, apprentices. And it's hard to grow without change. And change brings about doubt. This is why Mother Teresa disturbed so many people a few years ago when her journals were published. Do you remember that? And the world could see firsthand how real live doubt was alive in this saintly woman. She's a saint now. She spent her life sacrificing for the least of these and yet in her journals she said, I doubt. How can a woman like that doubt? I've come to believe that believing one thing can cause you to doubt 50 other things. And doubting one thing can cause you to believe 50 other things. Or it can cause you to believe in the one thing that you really can know. In fact, I would confess to you today, my brothers and sisters, I hope you don't fire me for this. I would confess to you today that more of my faith has been born out of doubt than any other thing in this world. And worship has been the midwife. It's worship that prevents faith from becoming calcified certainty that couldn't grow if it wanted to, and it doesn't. But it's also worship that prevents doubt from devolving into cynicism and helplessness. There must be room for both faith and doubt in our worship because both faith and doubt live in all of us. And it's worship that puts both faith and doubt in the service of God. Y'all, every Sunday we gather in this room and we say, I believe. Sometimes we say it with chest out and voice strengthened, robust courage, I believe. And sometimes we say it with knees knocking and voice quivering. Sometimes we say it from our mountaintops. And sometimes we whisper it when we're in the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes we say it with an exclamation point on the end, I believe. And sometimes we say it with a question mark on the end, I believe. Sometimes we say it as a form of profession. And sometimes we say it as a form of prayer. All I'm saying is this. Sometimes we worship because we believe. And sometimes we worship because we want to believe. Because we hope to believe. Because we need to believe. And that's okay too. I hope you know that. That's okay too. Because our faith is not in the quality of our faith. Our faith is in the source and object of our faith. The one who has been given all authority on heaven and in earth. And like Karl Barth, there may be days that we do not know whether we believe. But we do know the one in whom we believe. Brothers and sisters, there was room on that mountain for worshipers and doubters. I hope there's room in our church too. Let's pray. Lord, we believe We believe. Help our unbelief. We trust you with both. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.